you would take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Psalm 42. Wow, just want to take a moment and uh, thank the Father for speaking to us and through those songs, amen. You know, uh, I think any time truth is being spoken, it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit um, doing what He does, and that is He wants you to know what the Father's thinking. Do you understand that? Because the enemy is relentless in trying to get you to, to think totally opposite of what your father's thinking so the spirit is as jesus said when he comes he's not going to speak on his own authority but he's going to speak what he hears well who in the world is he listening to (laughs) well he's listening to the father and so man i'm just so thankful for those songs amen uh i don't know about you but uh they were a great blessing uh to sing and to think about our lord i want to talk about today I want to talk about finding rest for your soul. There's some of you here today inside, you're just, you're in turmoil. Uh, There's some of you here today, you know somebody outside in your family, a friend, a coworker that inside they're in turmoil. So I want to talk to you today about, about finding rest for your soul. And so let me give you the gospel right quick. You ready? There is rest for your soul. I want to read a verse to you or quote a verse that I I just, I know it because I've said it so many different times, but Jesus said to to the religious, he said to to those striving uh, to live this performance-based kind of lifestyle, he said, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, and you will find what? rest for your soul so what's cool about that is when Jesus said take my yoke upon you really if you study that in the Jewish understanding a yoke for a rabbi was their particular interpretation of the scripture so in other words he's inviting people to come and look at the world look at life the way that I look at it learn from me and as you do that guess what you're going to find you're going to find peace inside of here And the reason that a lot of us, we don't have peace here inside, the reason we're not resting is because we're looking at the world. We're looking at things the way the world looks at things, or we're learning from the world, and we're trying to fix this or solve this based on the world's mindset. But I'm going to tell you something. God's way is over there, and the world's way is way over there. I mean, two totally polar opposite perspectives and ways of looking at things okay but I love that he says take my yoke upon you learn from me you'll find rest for your soul so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that and I asked the question who is weary I mean who is heavy laden I know he's talking to the religious crowd I know he's talking to that performance driven person but you know even if you're saved There are times when inside we can forfeit our peace or we're not experiencing that peace or we're not at rest. This can happen to us as believers when we forget John 15 that reminds us that he's the vine and we're the branch and that without him we can't do anything. And that we're called and we're invited to to abide in him, to, to rest in him. So this can happen to us. The enemy wants your soul. You know that. Because your soul is where your mind is, it's where your will is, it's where your emotions are. And so the enemy wants this because he knows if he can get your soul, if he can get a hold of your heart, no wonder Solomon said, guard your heart with all diligence, right? Because he knows if he can get a hold of it, if he can get you to embrace his lies, then he can control your attitude and he can control all of your actions. Do you realize that? But you may be there. Your attitude may stink. Your actions may stink. But praise God, there is a Savior. Amen? (laughs) There is a Savior that loves you, that longs to deliver you. And all he's looking for is just, God, I need it. I want to receive it. I'm tired of fighting. So the enemy wants your soul. 
And some, as I said earlier, are experiencing some major, major turmoil inside. If not you, it's others. This week has been crazy for me. Uh, I, am, I, I am just absolutely blown away by the things that I have heard people tell me have happened to them in recent days. Because I, I'm sitting there literally across from them and they're, they're just tears in their eyes. They're talking about what's going on in their life. And I'm literally thinking to myself, God, I don't know how in the world I could make it if I were going through what they were going through. And I've talked to some other people this week, and it's just simply, hey, tell me a little bit about your life. And to hear about the things they've gone through, the ways they've suffered, the difficulty. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, man, how have you made it to this point? You know? I mean, aren't you glad, though, today that no matter what the struggle is, no matter how far down you may be, or no matter how far you feel like you are from peace, that it is there. And that it's not as far away as you might think so. So we're going to walk through this. Finding rest for your soul. Psalm 42, let's look at it. Verse 1, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my, my soul pants for you, O God. You've heard this before. Notice verse 2, though. He says, my soul, my soul. You get it? I mean, inside of here, man, in my inner being right here, my soul thirsts for you, O God. For the living God. Aren't you glad we serve the living God? I mean, man, this, is, this thing is not just some made-up fairy tale, but you and I, we serve the living God. So why don't we stop acting like he's like all these other gods that are dead, buried, and their bones are still in the tomb. Let's, let's stop acting that way, and let's get renewed in the reality that we serve the living God. And the living God says that where your sin abounds, grace abounds much more and this living God values you so much that he would give his son for you amen the living God my tears have been my food all day and all night while they continually say to me where is your God so this old boy struggling have you ever struggled and you're just hearing that voice that's kind of saying well where's God at because you know that happens right we get in a difficult time and we immediately start thinking where, where are you God because we, we think somehow that to have God and for Him to be near would be the absence of any struggle. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. When I remember these things, verse 4, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. With a voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept the pilgrim free. So he's reflecting back on where he was at one time in his life spiritually. And then he says, excuse me, verse 5, why are you cast down, O my soul? So I think it's interesting, like this psalmist is having a conversation with, with his insides. <laughs> he's like, why are you cast down? Why are you so discouraged? Why are you so depressed? He says, why are you disquieted within me? And notice what he says. He starts to preach to himself. He says, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I will remember from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon and from the hill Mazar. And we could read on. I want to encourage you to do just that but I got something that God wants you to hear from this the psalmist said in verse 2 he said my soul thirsts for God can I ask you a question how does the psalmist know that he thirsts for God that might sound a little retarded at first there right like a weird question but why is it or how is it that the psalmist knows that he is thirsting for God. How does, he, how does he know that? Well, let me ask you this. How do you know when you're thirsty? I'm a little bit thirsty right now. Don't go get me anything to drink, okay? I'm going to be all right. I won't keep you long. I'm thirsty right now. You know how I know? My throat's dry. I mean, you're out there sweating, and you're doing it. Some of you yesterday, you worked all day, and you were 
giving it your best, and, and, and there's a part of you physically that says to you, you're thirsty. That's, that's, that's how you know. How do you know you're hungry? Well, you have hunger pains, right? You have something built inside of you physically that's saying, you know, I'm hungry. It's, it's, it's something to eat. So how does the psalmist know that he thirsts for God? Well, the Bible clearly tells us in verse 5 that he's discouraged. Why are you cast down, O my soul? He is discouraged. He is depressed. And so this state, now listen to this, okay? Please hear me. This state of discouragement and depression is indicating to him this. Hey, I need God. Did you hear that? So this, this state that he's in, this state of discouragement, this state of despair, this state of depression is basically saying to him, hey, you need God. So these emotions, they're like the feelings that we have when we're hungry or we're thirsty. It's the way God has built us as the new creation. And so what's happening when I'm feeling afraid or when I'm feeling depressed or when I'm feeling anxious or when I'm feeling discouraged or whatever I may be feeling these are like alarms inside of us basically saying you need God now why is that so important for you to realize that why is it so important for you to to know that your anxiety or your anger or your depression why is it so important for you to know that that is a, a the way God created you to say you need God right now Because when a person is afraid, when a person is lonely, when a person is depressed, when a person is anxious, when a person is angry, when a person is discouraged, when a person is defeated, here's what happens. The enemy comes along and he tries to convince them that they need everything but God. Right? And trust me, the world has a solution for all of these things. Feeling lonely? Go here. <laughs> go to this website, try this, try that, go to this place, go to this bar. Do, I mean, really. I mean, you can look at each one of these emotions and you can see that the world has a, a, a possible solution for anything. So when you're in that state, the enemy's doing everything to convince you that you need everything but God. But what God wants you to understand is the way that he's built you, the way that you are, that when you're feeling those things, what it basically is telling you, hey, man, I need God. I need God. I need to just pull away. I need to find some kind of place where I can set my mind on the things above, when I can set my mind on who he is and who he's, what he's done in my life and the promises that he secured for me through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. You see, he doesn't want you to hear words like, for example, write these down, John chapter 4. Let me go back and read it because I don't have it memorized. But listen to John chapter 4. Listen to what Jesus said. He told the woman at the well, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Talking about the physical water. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So it's like when we drink the water that Jesus offers, in other words, we get into these particular states of emotions and different situations and we go to him and we let him fill us, we let him quench the thirst in our lives. What he says is that that thing is going to bubble up so much that it's going to spill out and it's going to hit the people around you. Because the enemy, I'm telling you, if you don't go to him and if you don't seek to quench your thirst in God, what it does is it gets you focused on nobody but you. And when you get focused on nobody but you, that is a very miserable place to be. Can I get an old me on that one? Yes. It's a horrible place to be. Whoa, 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 woe is me. Anybody ever said that? See, God wants you to learn to appreciate the struggle. Who appreciates the struggle in the room? See, it's hard when you're young, man, and you, you got struggle going on or you're experiencing failure or defeat. It's hard to even imagine how something like that could be used for good, is it not? But God has told us everywhere in his word that struggle is how he makes us stronger, is it not? 
That was a side note, but somebody needed to hear that. He doesn't want you to hear promises just like this one, John 6, 35. Listen to this. Jesus said, man, I'm the bread of life. So not only is he the water of life, he's the bread of life. And he says, he who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So do you see what he's offering you? He's saying, I can quench that thirst. I can, I can meet that need of hunger in your life. I can do that. I can satisfy you, okay? I can do that. You can find rest inside, but the only place you're getting it is in me. The only place you're getting it is in me. Go to James 1. Man, I'm all over the place today. But I love how all this connects. James 1, let's look at verse number 2. This is one of those words that God has given to his people to help them develop into a person who appreciates struggle. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I mean, really? I'm telling you, this week I've heard of some stuff that, man, I just don't know. I just don't know how I would respond. Now, I'm glad I could be there, and I'm glad that I could just be a listening ear. I'm glad that I could cry with them. I'm, I'm glad that I could quote some wonderful, glorious promises from God's Word. I'm glad that I could sit there and have a wonderful prayer and believe God and these kinds of things, but I'm just thinking deep down, Lord, I don't know how I could deal with that. I don't know how I could rejoice in that, but look what it says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The testing is the refinement process. You understand that. You understand that with precious metals. They will heat up those precious metals to a degree so they can get all the impurities out. You've heard this a million times. So that all you're left with is that pure, precious metal itself. So he says that. Knowing the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be mature, complete, lacking nothing. Now do you appreciate your struggle? <laughs> how many of you, when you read that, listen, how many of you honestly, sometimes it's hard to believe that? If you're just being honest, it's hard to believe that. Right? God's okay with that. He really is. I love it with the disciples. How many times I think about Mark 4 when he said, Guys, why are you so fearful? I mean, you're scared to death for your life. I'm over here asleep on a pillow. You come over here shaking me like you're about to die. So I get up and I just, I want to take a moment and show you how I see the world. Next thing you know, there's no wind blowing, there's no waves. And so, do you realize, I think, you, you know, we're over here in turmoil thinking life's coming to an end, and, and our God is, is sleeping, not disrespectfully, but that's the kind of peace He has, and that's the kind of peace that He wants you to enjoy inside, no matter what the circumstance is. Just because you know who He is. Just because if He says to His children, we're going to the other side, guess what? We're going to the other side. Just like if he says an elephant is getting ready to, to lay an egg, you better be getting a skillet ready, all right? That's the way God is. I know that don't happen, but if he says it's going to happen, get her ready. All right, some of y'all are asleep today. But he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, verse 5, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally. Man, what a promise. What does that mean? God, I don't know what to do, man. I can't rejoice in this trial. I just can't find the good in the struggle. I, I don't know what to do. And, 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 and you know, God, what, what is it? But here's what he's saying. He saying, just know in that time when you don't know that I'm going to give you the answer and I'm going to do it freely. Sometimes we feel like we got to cop this deal with God. Like, oh God, if you'll just help me out of this, if you'll just do this, then I'll do that for you. Anybody ever been there? That's hogwash. That's hogwash. Now, I'm going to stand on it till the day I die. God is not looking at your work to find pleasure in you. You better start believing that. 
The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. He's not looking for your work to find pleasure in you, okay? Not saying he wants you to sit around and do nothing. He'll work you slap to death if you just open your heart, let the Spirit move. <laughs> You'll find yourself bringing life and hope and refreshment to all kind of people if you just set your agenda to the side and say, all right, today is your day, God. You have plans. You have good works that are already prepared beforehand. So my body is just going to be an open vessel for you to do what you want to do. And I guarantee you'll start looking around being like, man, wow, look at what God is up to. Look at what God is doing. So let him ask. Or he says he gives liberally without reproach. In other words, you know, I love the fact, sometimes I ask questions, and people will look at me, and basically I, I can see it in their eyes. They're like, that's a dumb question, man. You, you, you should know the answer to that. But aren't you glad God doesn't do that? Aren't you glad he's not sitting up there going, Matt, you goofy rascal, have you not figured this thing out yet? I mean, you just keep going back over this. I mean, come on, man, would you just get it together? He's not doing that. But let him ask in faith. How many of us are asking in faith? Let me just ask you this real quick. And, and, and this, this, I, I got to preface this with this statement. This is my opinion. Okay? Everybody listening? Everybody listening? I'm going to preface this with my opinion, all right? If you're praying and you're not writing down your prayers, I don't believe you're really believing God to answer it. Now, that's my opinion. Nothing of the Word says that you have to do it. But I don't know about you, but man, when I'm asking God for something, I want to write it down because He says if we'll ask, He'll give us the answer. He'll show us. A lot of times we just do these little fly-by prayers, you know? Oh, God, help so-and-so, da-da-da, whatever, help me this. But are we really expecting God to move and work in a situation? So here's what I'm going to say. James chapter 1, he starts talking about trials. God wants you to appreciate the struggle. So trials are going to come. The rest, the peace you have inside, the enemy is going to attack it, right? He doesn't want you to experience that in spite of your situation. But here's what I know from the text. And this is what James wants you to understand. That with every trial, the enemy wants to come along and turn that trial into a temptation to sin. Do you realize that? Like, like he, you're going through a struggle... So what he wants to do, he wants to come along, and what he wants to do is he wants to try to take that and turn that in, into a temptation for you to sin against him, to hurt yourself or to hurt other people that are around you. So the warning James give us, gives us is this. He says, don't listen to his lies, because if you receive those lies, they will always produce death, and you see it in the text, verse 14. Or verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted that God is tempting them. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone with evil. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, listen, here's the warning. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So if you buy into the lie, if you buy into the lie in the state of your discouragement, your depression, your anxiety, your fear, your anger, if you believe the lie, ladies and gentlemen, it is always going to produce death. Can I get an amen? Or does anybody want to stand up and say, you know what, preacher, there was a time. I believed the lie, I took the lie, and I did it, and it turned out to be a complete disaster. Anybody want to share? <laughs> a complete disaster. All I did was hurt myself. All I did was hurt everybody around me. But here's what I wanted to just simply say. Look at what he says in verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. See, see this, is, this is what we've got to be careful about, church. This is why we need each other. This is why it's got to be bigger than Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. Or it's got to be bigger than this because we've got to constantly remind each other that we cannot be deceived. We cannot be deceived by the lies of the enemy. 
that's telling us, hey, this is okay or that's okay because culture is changing and there are a lot of things in culture right now that at one time even the lost world wouldn't accept it. Do you understand that? But now that stuff has leaked into the church and now the church is even saying, I know of one situation where a lady left a man who was a pastor, left him, said, I can't believe what Southern Baptists believe in him any longer. And a lot of it had to do with the subject of homosexuality and several other different things. I mean, things that even the lost world at one time would have said no to. Look what's happening. So our job with each other, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, because if you believe the lie, death is what awaits. But look what it says. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, he's not ever going to stop giving good and perfect gifts. Man, that's good. He's never going to stop doing that. Even in spite of your decisions. That's one of those places, church, where it's like you would think we would just come unglued right there. I mean, you would think that we would lay aside all of inhibitions and just like run around the place. I mean, just like praising God, worshiping God, knowing that he never changes, that he never stops giving good and perfect gifts. It's only the enemy who's saying, well, you're not getting that today because of what you've done. But do you realize... I mean, if you, I mean, can you only imagine that if it were like that, if it were all based on your performance, I mean, how much good and perfect are you going to get anyway? That's why the Word of God says, it is by grace that you are saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. That's why we show up today to worship Him. We're not here today for me to brag about what I did last week. We're not here to hear what you did last week. We're here to hear what God did through us last week. We're here to hear how good he is, how great he is, and how my future is secure and protected because he has me in his hand, and he promised me that nothing in this world could snatch me from his grip. Amen? See, I'm trying to pump you up. I'm getting there. We will just stay another 30 minutes before we get it, all right? Now I'd probably make some of you matter, so I ain't going to do that. But look what it says. Verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Y'all, how did you come from death to life? By the word of truth. There's the gospel. There's the gospel. How did you go from death to life? It's the gospel. How do you go from no peace to peace? How do you go from no rest to rest? It's the gospel. It's the truth of God that brings you forth, that, that bursts you into that place of peace and rest. I love the whole story of Peter walking on water because that's what some of you need to hear today. Because you're inside the boat and you're, you're in turmoil and you're like, you know, God, if you'll just, you just bid me to come on the water, I'll come. And what does Jesus say? Come. And old Peter, what does he do? He gets out of the boat. He gets up and he goes out. And when he goes out, he experiences the supernatural. Y'all, he's the living God. He's the supernatural God. And man, I'm telling you, I've been experiencing him over the last few weeks, and I've been reminded that he is the living one and the supernatural one who is longing for you to just lay aside self and just open up and receive from him. Stop trying to earn it. Stop trying to, to perform for it. So look at this, and we'll close. So we're talking about finding that rest. Well, James says, look, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You want to find rest? Listen, tune in to the voice of God. And you might look at me and you say, Matt, I can't hear the voice of God for all the clutter. I've got so much noise in my head, I cannot even hear the voice of God. But I want to ask you this. Have you ever asked the Spirit of God to quiet your mind so that you could hear the voice of God. We cleaned the basement out yesterday. My wife liked to kill me, cleaning basement and breathing dust and all these other things. We took a whole truckload of stuff to Goodwill. So what we basically did, we got out the clutter. 
we got all the junk out. So God's calling us to tune into his voice. But then he says in verse 21, he says, look, lay aside all the filthiness and overflow of wickedness. In other words, you got to deal with the noise. You got to deal with the clutter, right? You got to deal with it. I mean, it's amazing how much room we have in the basement now. Now that we've gotten rid of some stuff and we move some stuff around, there's some organization, there's some order to some stuff, right? But what I see today in my own life and in a lot of, a lot, a lot of people that claim to be Christians, I don't see us dealing with the junk and the clutter. I don't see us taking that seriously, realizing that it's keeping us from hearing the voice that we need to hear, to hear the voice of truth, to hear the life that we need, to be at rest, to be at peace in the midst of the difficult situation. So your anger's not going to do anything for you. So what do you got to do? Deal with the clutter. And here it is. Look at it. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. Look what it says, this phrase, which is able to save your soul. Tune in. Deal with the noise. And then you have this thing called the engrafted word. Now here's my opinion, don't have a lot of time. But in my belief and understanding of that phrase, I believe it is James' way of referring to the Holy Spirit that was given to you the day that you were born again. Study it out, whatever. But here's what this tells me, and you got to hear this, okay? you got to hear this. The key to that rest, that victory, that deliverance, the key to it is it's not about your performance, but it's about whether or not you're willing to receive it. Did anybody in the church just hear that? That rest, that peace, that, that, that victory that you want to experience, you got to realize it can't be earned but it can only be received. Same way with your salvation. So stop trying to overcome your fear, your depression, and your anger. Now that sounded foolish. Stop trying to overcome it. Because if you're trying to overcome it, you're doing a job that you were never given to do. That's the spirit of God's job. Just like it says, receive with meekness the word that is able to save your soul. That inner turmoil. The only thing that can save you or deliver you from that is the Word that's in you. It's learning to hear the voice of the Spirit, living by the Spirit. So I ask you, is there anyone depressed, discouraged, angry, anxious, afraid, or confused? As a new creation, this is God's way of saying to you, you need me. You need me. So the question for us today is, are we ready and are we willing to truly open our hearts to what God has to say? Will we tune in to his voice? I'm not giving you a one-time plan. I'm giving you something that you've got to learn to practice spiritually moment by moment and day by day. But I've learned that the struggle is intended to humble you and to bring you into a more dependent relationship with God. Find rest today. Enjoy that peace today by being willing to humble yourself and open your heart to the ministry of the God who lives inside of you. Father, we thank you. I'm just thankful for the gospel. I'm thankful for hope. I'm thankful for the fact that every single person in this room has been given access to you through Jesus. And I believe you're inviting all of us to come. And I don't believe for one second it's come to this altar or this is not where there's a magic, this is not a magical place. But Lord, there are some folk here that need to take a moment and maybe come here And acknowledge to God, hey God, look, I've been looking to the world for the answers. I've been looking to myself for the answers. It's time, God. I'm in turmoil. I've got no peace. I've got no rest. It's time to open to you.
Father, thank you. Thank you for what you've made available to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me?